Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug and this is my AP Chemistry channel and in this video we're looking at solution stoichiometry. Now in the previous video we learned about some of the the factors that can make some substances more or uh, less soluble in water. In this one we're actually going to look at some mathematics here and apply some of the same stoichiometry uh, methods that we learned in uh, earlier in this course to uh, solutions. So we're going to use the very same three-step process that we learned earlier in order to solve stoichiometry problems. Now in case you've forgotten what that uh, what that is, don't forget that the first step is to convert to moles and we're going to do that. But instead of converting to moles using the molar mass of something, we're going to use the molarity as a conversion factor. And I'll show you how we do that here in just a minute. We're going to start with liters and then we convert to moles using molarity. As always, the second step in these types of reaction stoichiometry problems will be the mole ratio, which is the same as it always has been. And then the third step is going to be convert to whatever final unit we are asked to convert to in the problem. Usually grams, but it might be something else. So we're going to go ahead and start. Let's try this problem here. So in this uh, problem, a, a student tries to produce a precipitate of barium sulfate with the following reaction. We have that reaction. It's balanced. If the student adds 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar barium nitrate solution to excess sodium sulfate solution, what mass of barium sulfate solid should be produced? Well, we're going to start with what's given to us. So like I said, the 50 milliliters of barium nitrate. Now, it's in my best interest to go ahead and write that in liters. Just go ahead and convert that. So that's 0.05 liters of barium nitrate. And in this stoichiometry question, it's asking us how many grams or what mass of barium sulfate. So I'm going to put that down here at the end. And we're going to go through our three-step process. Now, step one is to convert to moles. So liters will go on the bottom and moles will go on top. Now, how many moles, how many liters? This is where we use the molarity because it says that the barium nitrate is 0 0.100 molar. That means 0 0.100 moles for every one liter. I'm going to use that in this conversion factor. In solution chemistry, that's the easiest way to do these. So put 0 0.100 moles for every one liter. That's including the, that's how I include the molarity as the conversion factor. So now I can cancel liters and I'm in moles of barium nitrate. That's all you got to do here. Now step two is the same as it always has been. It's the mole ratio. We're going to put barium nitrate on the bottom and we're converting to barium sulfate so that goes on the top and looks like our conversions or rather our mole ratio is a one to one in this case. Now step three is convert to the final unit which is grams. I'm trying to find grams so that means moles on the bottom, grams on top and how many grams are in a mole of barium sulfate? Well we can add that up on the periodic table that seems to be about 233.39 if you add that all up. One barium, one sulfur, and four oxygens. So moles cancel. And when we do the arithmetic here, take 0 0.05 times 0.1 times 233.39, I get an answer of 1.17 grams of barium sulfate that we can expect to produce. So that's the answer. So notice it's basically the same stoichiometry as we've always done except step one, we're using a molarity to convert to moles instead of the mole ratio, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, the molar mass rather, or, or something else. Now let's ask, answer this question. After the reaction is complete, some ions will remain in solution. Rank the following ions in order from lowest to greatest concentration. We have barium ions, sodium ions, and sulfate ions. So, which one will have the lowest concentration of those three? Well, if I look at the balanced equation up here, I can see that sodium and nitrate will be produced, but in an aqueous form. That means that they're going to exist as ions, sodium and nitrate. So, 
I would expect to have a lot of sodium here at the end. So I'm going to guess, actually it's more than a guess, I'm pretty sure of this, that sodium is probably going to be the highest one. We're going to have a lot of sodium in there. Now, what about the barium and the sulfate? Well, remember, it's sodium sulfate that's excess. That's the excess react. It says so right there in the problem. So we're going to have some excess sulfate left over. So I'm pretty sure that sulfate is going to be there too, but that one's going to be in the middle. There's not going to be as much as I had of the, of the sodium, but I'll still have a good amount of it. I think the barium is going to be the smallest because that's the limiting reactant. I'm adding that in a smaller amount, and notice where all that barium goes. All the barium is going straight to the precipitate, so it's not going to be in solution at all. It's a solid, as it says right here, and so I would expect there to be very little barium ion in this. So I would say that barium would be the least, and then sulfate would be the next, and sodium should be the highest concentration. Let's try another problem involving solution stoichiometry. We're going to have another balanced equation. It says, in the reaction above, a zinc phosphate precipitate is produced. If a chemist adds 60 milliliters of 0.1 molar zinc chloride solution to 75 milliliters of 0.15 molar sodium phosphate solution, what mass of zinc phosphate solid should be produced? Well, do you see how this problem is different from the last one? We're not told that one we have one value and then the other is excess. We have two numerical values given for each of the reactants. So this sounds like a limiting reactant problem, kind of like we did way back in, uh, in an earlier lesson, isn't it? So we're going to set this up here. I'm going to take the 0.06 liters of zinc chloride and the 0.075 liters of sodium phosphate and write those down. And we're trying to find out grams, uh, that's mass, of zinc phosphate. So way down here at the end, I'll put grams of zinc phosphate for both of those. So we're going to solve the problem twice and find which one gives us the lower number. So for uh, the zinc chloride process, we'll start with that first. And for step one, it hits convert to moles. So that means liters on the bottom and moles on top. And since this is a solution, we're going to use molarity as the, the way to convert to moles. So it says for zinc chloride, it's 0.1 moles per liter. So I'm going to put that in here, 0.1 moles for every one liter. I cancel liters top and bottom. I'm now in moles of zinc chloride. Step two is the mole ratio. So I'll put zinc chloride on the bottom, zinc phosphate on the top, and looks like it's a 1 to 3 ratio from those coefficients. So 1 to 3. Zinc chloride is out. I'm now in moles of zinc phosphate. I want to be in grams of zinc phosphate. So step 3 is to convert to that final unit, which is going to be grams. So moles goes on the bottom. Grams goes on the top, because that's what I'm converting to. And if we add all these together, three zinc atoms and two phosphorus atoms and eight oxygen atoms, that's a total of 386.17 grams per mole. So I can cancel moles top and bottom, and I can do the arithmetic on my calculator. 0.06 times 0.1 divided by 3 times 386.17, and I get about 0.772 grams of zinc phosphate. Now I have to do the problem again to do the second process and see which one is smaller. So we'll go, have to start from scratch again. We're going to put liters on the bottom, moles on top, but this time we're dealing with the sodium phosphate. So the sodium phosphate is 0.15 moles per liter. So that's going to go into the conversion factor. 0.15 moles per one liter. Liters will be out. And second step is, is the mole ratio. So sodium phosphate goes on the bottom and zinc phosphate goes on top. And that's going to be a 1 to 2 ratio this time from the coefficients. Sodium phosphate's out. And now step 3 is convert to the final unit, which is grams. So moles 
will go on the bottom and grams on top. And once again, zinc phosphate is still 386.17 grams per mole. So I do the arithmetic this time, 0.075 times 0.15 divided by 2 times 386.17, and I get an answer of 2.17 grams. When I have two different answers, which one is the correct one? Well, hopefully, you all remember that it's the smaller one. So the actual mass of zinc phosphate is going to be that number right there, 0.772 grams of zinc phosphate. Now, which compound is the limiting reactant or the limiting reagent? Well, remember from our limiting reactant lesson way back there, it's whichever one, whichever reactant produces that smaller amount. So we go back and it is zinc chloride. It's that, whoops, it is that amount that produced a smaller value. All right, so let's try one more example. This is a multi-part one here. We have a 0.15 gram sample of solid lead 2 nitrate that's added to 125 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium iodide solution. Assume no change in the volume of the solution when you add the solid to the solution. And it says that a chemical reaction takes place that is represented by this equation. So we have the balanced equation given to us. So we have several parts here. This actually has five parts to it. So this might be a, an AP style question. So list an appropriate observation that provides evidence of a chemical reaction between the two compounds. Well, hopefully you'll see a solid precipitate. So that led to iodide. I think that's a yellow precipitate, but we should see that solid formed. So yeah, there we go. That solid precipitate is formed when the two reactants are mixed together. So you want to say something about the precipitate being formed. You don't have to know what, what color it is necessarily, but at least say that it's, it's being formed. Calculate the number of moles of each reactant. Well, we have 0.15 grams of the lead 2 nitrate. Let's do that one first. So we'll write that down. And this is just a simple grams to moles conversion. So we're going to put our uh, in our conversion factor grams on the bottom and moles on top and we have to add up the molar mass of this so one lead it's about 207.2 we have two nitrogens at 14 apiece and six oxygens at 16 apiece so that is 331.21 grams in a mole of that so we divide it and we get about 4.53 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of lead to nitrate. We have the other one here, 0.125 liters of sodium iodide, and it's 0.1 molar. So remember our shortcut from a while back, a molarity times liters equals moles. So just multiply those by each other, and we get that we have 0.0125 moles of sodium iodide. So just a simple mole calculation for both of those. Now for part C, Let's identify the limiting reactant. And it says show calculations to support your identification. So we're going to take those mole values that we just got in part B. We just calculated those. And let's figure how many moles of, since the solid is lead iodide, let's, let's convert to that. So we'll convert to moles of lead iodide. Now, we would go through our three-step process, but notice that step one is already done for us. These are already in moles. So we can go straight to step two, which is the mole ratio. So lead to nitrate goes on the bottom. Lead to iodide goes on top. And this one is a one to one ratio. So cancels and it's the same number, 4.53 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of lead to iodide. Now for the sodium iodide, once again, we're already in moles, so we can go straight to mole ratio. So sodium iodide on the bottom and lead iodide on the top. And this time it's a one to two ratio. From the coefficients, I can divide and I get 6.25 times 10 to the negative third. So the limiting reactant, as we know, is whichever reactant makes the smaller number. So this one is the smaller number. You know, so that's how many moles we're going to expect to make. And the limiting reactant is that one right there. So it's lead to nitrate is going to run out first. 
Now part D, calculate the molar concentration of nitrate in the mixture after the reaction is complete. Well, it's interesting that the nitrate is part of the sodium nitrate in the second product here, and it's aqueous, which means it's completely dissolved, and so there will not be any nitrate solid to speak of. It's all going to be uh, dissolved in solution. So I guess we need to figure out how many moles of nitrate we stuck in the solution to start with. Well, we know that we put in 4.53 times 10 to the minus fourth moles of lead nitrate, so we can write that down and define the moles of nitrate, we can just do a simple mole ratio. So we put lead nitrate on the bottom and nitrate on top, and the coefficient, that little two right there, shows us that there are two nitrates in every one formula unit of lead two nitrate. So when you cancel and multiply, we get that we have 9.06 times 10 to the minus fourth moles of nitrate. Now, if you want to know the molar concentration, well, that's molarity, isn't it? So that's moles divided by liters. So we have to divide by however many liters we had. And the problem said it was 125 milliliters. So that's 0.125 liters. It says we're not assuming any volume change, so it's still that. We divide it out, and we get 7.25 times 10 to the minus third molar nitrate. So that's the answer. So that's a little bit more complicated, but certainly within our realm of possibility. All right, let's do the last section here. I know this is a long problem, but let's do the last one here. Let's circle the diagram that best represents the results after the mixture reacts com as completely as possible. Explain the reasoning used in making your choice. Well, let's just go through here and use what we figured out in parts A, B, C, and D to answer E. Now, the very first thing you noticed is that lead 2 iodide was the precipitate. That was the solid in the balanced equation. So as a result, I can actually eliminate a few of these. Uh, I can eliminate that one, because that one says no precipitate. Uh, this one has the wrong precipitate listed, so I'm going to X that out too, so I can el eliminate a couple of them. And notice that in part uh, C, Part C, I believe it was, uh, or the one that we just did, uh, part C, yes. We actually figured out that lead nitrate was the limiting reactant. So that means that the lead ran out. There should be no lead ions in the solution. They all went directly into the precipitate. So if I find any lead ions in there in the solution, I need to eliminate that. Now, here's one. You see we have lead still shown in, in solution there, and lead was all gone, so that's not the right one. So I'm going to X that out. Uh, the others don't. Iodide was the excess reactant. That's why I was able to eliminate this one here, because we should have a little bit of iodide left in solution, as we do here. So uh, this one actually is the correct picture that represents what's going on there. So kind of a, a longer, more complex problem. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something about solution stoichiometry. It can be complex, but really it's the same as the earlier type of reaction stoichiometry that we've already learned. Please give me a thumbs up if you learned something. I'm Jeremy Krug. I teach AP Chemistry, and I hope to see you again on my channel again, where we can learn some more chemistry together.